This program is brought to you by the friends and partners of Biblical Life TV. Deep waters to nurture and empower the remnant for the last days. There is a power that is about ready to be released from heaven to those that seek after the things of the kingdom of God. When it comes to the word of God, there is a supernatural unction of the Holy Spirit to learn. God is up to something for those that will study to show yourself approved. Right now there's a lot of things in the kingdom that God is trying to establish that goes against people's theology. You need to understand your roots, where you came from. God may require us to change what we're doing to make walking in the kingdom a higher priority than it ever was before. We were never called to have a little light. We were called to be ablaze with the fire of God in this generation. Join the remnant from around the world who are empowered by the word of God to fulfill God's purpose in these last days. God is speaking something different. That is going to be essential in the days ahead. And that's part of this anointing that we have to have. Prepare yourselves for spirit-filled teaching. Biblical Life TV. Now that the feasts are over, we're going to pick back up with Kingdom Foundations and Functional Faith. If you have your Bibles today, I want to go back to 2 Timothy chapter 2, starting in verse 19. You know, there's so much that can be unpacked in this. And I'm already feeling the urge to depart from my notes. I'm still working on the notes that I had for the first session that I got long-winded and only used the first page. But let's read this again. Nevertheless, the solid foundation of God stands, having this seal. The Lord knows those who are His. And ever let everyone who names the name of Christ depart from iniquity. You know, the more that we begin understanding the universe around us, we understand the 12 dimensions of creation, the concept of temporal mechanics, and layer over the top of it the omnipresence of God. Some of the things that the Apostle Paul speaks of in here, dealing in Romans with foreknowledge, predestination, foreordination, all of a sudden make a lot of sense. How many know that God is not waiting for this thing to unfold? For him, it's a done deal. When you understand properly the omnipresence of God, when he said light be and created the temporal dimension or created time, he filled it the same way that you would fill a glass full of water. God does not experience linear time. He's the great I am. He is the I am. I'm the now. And for God, all of human history, even that which is yet to unfold, is now for him. That's almost mind-boggling, isn't it? That before the foundation of the world, not only was Jesus the Lamb slain before the foundation of the world, but before the foundation of the world, Almighty God knew your name. He knew everything that you were going to do. This is one of the things where um, Calvin missed it. Calvin was a micromanager, and so he interpreted predestination, not only pulled it out of the Nag Hammadi with the divine emanations that the mystery religions teach to overcome the Catholic Church, he centered in on predestination and forgot about foreknowledge. Foreknowledge precedes predestination. That God saw every decision that you were going to make. He saw how that you were going to yield to the gospel. He saw every struggle that you were going to have and everything else. And because he knew that, he put his seal of approval on it because God gave you free will. Now one of the paradoxes of this is this. The sinner that will reject him his entire life and go to a devil's hell, God also put his seal of approval on it because the man or the woman had made up their mind. 
It's not that God, before time began, said, you can be saved, but no matter how much you cry out for God, you're never going to get saved because you weren't predestined to be saved. It doesn't work that way. It's based on foreknowledge. Okay? Paul was very succinct. Foreknowledge comes before predestination. Predestination comes before being foreordained. And I think there's a place in God's life. I'm going to get into this. I'm getting ready to open up a can of worms. Can I do that? There are a lot of remnant right now that are in bondage, that really want to serve God that can't. And so when you look at the predestination and foreordination of God, there comes a place in their life that God says, I see the desire of your heart, and therefore I'm going to go ahead and hit the nitric oxide, and as I hit it, because of my great name, you're going to blow off every bondage because I see the desire of your heart. We're at one of those moments right now in the body of Christ. But, how many know that the world is stuck on stupid? And it keeps pushing the gas pedal all the way to the floor. Okay? God is about ready to hit their nitric oxide as well. This is the way you want to go? Might as well hit 160 while you're doing it. Because there's nothing I can do to change your mind. Therefore, I'm going to let you hit, I'm going to hit your nitric oxide button to get you out of the way of the remnant. <gasps> That's what it means about prophetic times. Oh, just look, just look at Bible prophecy, Bible history. There was a pagan king named Nebuchadnezzar. Nebuchadnezzar, God decided to use as a pawn to exercise judgment on Judah. And was so bold to even call him his servant. But when Nebuchadnezzar got the big head and thought he was the next Nimrod, God struck him. With insanity, in fact, the Bible says that the good watchers, the watchers that had not fallen, he offended them, and he was struck with madness. And when he came out of that madness, he said, there's only one God, <laughs> and there's none like him. God can do those things throughout human history. He can do those things now. He knows you. He knows you before you even know yourself. Do you ever you know, see people, then they, they do crazy things. They'll leave husband and wife and everything else because they've got to go out and find themselves. Let me tell you how you find yourself. You fall in love with the only one who knows you. And by knowing him, you discover who you are. Oh, that's a theology that'll preach. When you get lost in Jesus, you discover who you can only be through him. He that would lose his life will gain it. I like what the Amplified says. He who lays down this lower life gains the high life. No, it doesn't come in a can called Miller beer, or whichever beer that is. The true high life can only be found in Christ. Because before the foundations of the world, he knew you and knew your heart. He knew every struggle. He knew the hardships that you would go through. And he didn't tell us that because we walk with him that we avert those hardships. Sometimes he takes our hand. And to be frank, sometimes he throws us over his shoulder to walk us through the hard times. Because he said, listen, as long as you're in this world, you're going to have tribulation. But be of good cheer because I have overcome the world. Those moments when you can't go on. And Jesus picks you up like a little lamb and throws you over his shoulder to carry you through that trial. That is him overcoming the world through you. I need to write this down. This to make a good book. But he knew you. He knows who are his. And heaven, the moment that you said, I want Jesus, forgive me of my sins. Let your sacrificial blood cover my sins. And I, I, I want you to be my Savior. I want you to be my Messiah. You're my King. I'll follow you. I'm going to get off my throne. Well, I'm advocating the throne. Please get on it. Heaven, with great anticipation, was waiting. 
Can, can you see the angels looking over the seal of heaven? Thinking, what's going to happen next? But God already knows. And the Holy Spirit is ready that moment that He moves in, creates the new birth, puts His seal on you. All of heaven says, I can't believe He got that done in that guy's life. Or that woman's life. And the Father just smiled and said, I knew it all the time. Because I knew them. That's reassurance for the believer. When the prophecy hits the fan, I serve a God who knows and knows my name. I remember listening to a Tommy Walker album, and he was talking about a time that they were over in an orphanage overseas. And so the kids don't really have a name. They, they have no mother, they have no father, they, they have no last name, if you will. And this little boy just kind of really endeared himself to Tommy Walker. And he was really concerned that Tommy would remember his name. Because he didn't have a mom or dad who would. And Tommy shared that the next time he came, he saw that little boy and he called him out by name and his lies lit up and came running up to Tommy. And that moment the Holy Spirit spoke up and said, Tommy, I know your name. You were just like that little boy. Oh. He knows everything that we're going to go through. He prepares a way. The cross was not an act of desperation. It was an absolute act of love. The Bible says that he was able to endure the suffering of the cross for the hope that was before him. And I've read many people that tried to define that hope. That hope was you. He saw you. Can you imagine at the moment when he was crying out, Father, why have you forsaken me? And Jesus in the Spirit, the hope that was set before him, he saw every single person that would hope in him. And he knew their names. He knew their faces. The nails did not hold Jesus to the cross. His will held him to the cross. Because he was out to get you. <laughs> now what is the evidence? Because that, that is a sure foundation of the kingdom of God. God knows you. He knows those that are his. Doesn't say that he recognizes denominations or even the title of independent churches. God does not recognize that. Either you're his or you're not. That's it. In a world of transhumanism, of, of, of trying and we're worrying about Nephilim and the Raphaim and the Gibberim beginning to manifest themselves again, both coming up out of the earth and what transhumanism is doing, they don't know that human 2.0 is already here. Every believer was made a new creature. Now, we're not quite fully there yet. We do not know what it's going to be fully like when all this is said and done. But when we see him, we know we're going to be just like him. Glorified body, not a robotic body, is human 2.0. Save spirit the moment you get born again. We're still working on our souls. It's, uh, or it's uh, organized chaos moving toward <laughs> maturity. And the final step of redemption is that new body. I can't wait to see it because it will be your DNA brought to perfection with a body at its zenith and you get to live that for all eternity. Glory to God. I don't know, I may fit back into those 30 inch, 32 inch waist jeans I used to fit into eons ago. <laughs> it seems like eons ago. But he knows, but here's the hallmark of when you really know Jesus. Let those that call upon the name of Jesus depart from iniquity. 
You see, in the last days, there's going to be a lot of, of people that Jesus said, you're going to say, Lord, Lord, have we not done this in your name? Have we not hugged trees in your name? Have we not marched and, and, and protected forests in your name and protected the environment in your name and, and built orphanages in your name and did this in your name and that in your name? And Jesus said, I never knew you. Now, when you understand the impact of what I just said, now he, in, you know, in a sense, he knows every sinner, but it's talking about intimacy. Because our sins separate us from God. And then he goes on to say, I never knew you. Depart from me, you workers of iniquity. Those that call upon the name of the Lord, depart from iniquity. Those that have name only but have never entered into that relationship, embrace iniquity. And use the veneer of religion to mask and give them permission to do sinful things. That's why we have denominations that are rejecting the Word of God over whatever social thing is going on today. Whether it's redefining marriage, there's no right in the Word of God for you to do that. Or redefine this issue or that issue. Or to embrace other religions that are based off of the mystery Babylon religions. God's not called us to do that. We're to be separate from that. By blending that, we're blending the profane with the holy. And I, I, I suggest to you that the reasons that are happening is they don't know him. They're serving another Jesus. They're serving a system. They're serving a denomination. We have got to get You know what? God's not going to bless you just because you come here. You've got to walk it out yourself. People trust in church membership. They trust in denominations. Some say, I'm of Apollos. Some say, I'm of Tom Horn. Some say, I'm of Steve Quayle. Some say, I'm of this one or that one. Some get real spiritual and say, I'm of Christ. Paul rebukes them all because of their pride. He said, listen, this, this is what matters. It's our, it's, it's our halicha, it is our individual walk with God. And if I'm really walking with God, every step that I take for, with Him leads me further away from iniquity and more into righteousness and holiness. If it's not, I'm walking with the wrong guy. It's not the God of the Bible. It is an idol. What's the definition of idols? You start making shapes that prefer that you prefer and calling them God. And so we can have the liberal Jesus. We're not dealing with Jesus. It's an idol. Come on now. Make you think. Let's go on to 1 John chapter 3. None of that was in my notes, by the way. Because that's where we're, where we're seeing... Uh, Tom Horn years ago and I got to collaborate in an article but even before I even knew what, what it was about. I only had like 30 days to write the article. The Coming Blood on the Altar, the Christian versus Christian War. You can bear the name of Christ and not know Jesus. And those that don't know him but try to wear his name as a badge are going to eventually go to war with those that really know him. Because they will align themselves with the son of perdition and his system. Now in 1 John, John shares with us a secret. How many of us ever prayed? And it's like you try to pray and it doesn't get past here because there's something on the inside of you that kind of backs off. And I used to think it was the devil. Oh man, the devil's fighting me from believing God for my new fancy doodle wop. <laughs> you know. My new fancy thing that I want, and, and I'm trying to pray, and I'm trying to believe God, and I'm, I'm trying to work up faith. Remember that in the faith movement? And finally, you just throw money at it if nothing else will work. <laughs> well, if that worked, the government would do it. They would be flawless in all their executions of everything because they throw billions of dollars at stuff that simply gets sucked down a, a black hole somewhere, and you never see anything of it. 
Doesn't work. You think it's the devil. What if it was your own spirit? Knowing that what you're praying is either not in line with the Word of God, and your spirit man backs off because the Torah was written on your heart. You see, in your spirit, your spirit man knows the Word of God backwards and forwards, even if you've never opened the book. It's our head is where all the problem is. That's why the, the James said, listen, be, receive the, the engrafted word with meekness. You humble yourselves before the word. You don't get haughty with it because it's going to correct you. Because your souls need to be saved. And he wrote that to the church. And most of us have not entered into that sanctification process the way that we should. We're trying to make the word and twist it to our inclinations rather than the word crucifying those inclinations and replacing them with kingdom principles. And so I'm trying to pray for something and my spirit man's backing off. And the only time that faith really functions, functional faith that works properly, is when your spirit, your soul, and your body are in perfect alignment and agreement with God's Word. If you don't have sin in your life because you have been walking in the commandments of God and you've been following the leading of the Holy Spirit and there's no place of disobedience and your mind is now renewed to the Word, because when Jesus said, listen, whatever you ask the Father in my name, we don't hear that with the same ears that the original people that he spoke to heard that. They understood the, the concept of carrying the weight of the name of God. If I would come in the name of another, I have got to represent myself as that other person would. When I pray, I've got to pray as Jesus would pray in that situation. And so, there's no sin. I'm walking in the ways of God. I have thought this thing through to pray the way that Jesus would pray, and I am physically doing what the Word of God says I would do. That is a triple barrel shotgun for effective faith, and it will not only get your prayers answered, it will nail the devil to the wall every time. But out of our desperation, we don't want to do that. And so we turn on Christian TV and it's like Ronco Shopping Network. Give here and I'll send you a three cent cruise of oil for your $200 gift. Or, or there was one where that, that you, would, you, would, you would take the bread that they sent you and you place your wallet underneath the bread. And then after you placed your wallet underneath the bread, all of a sudden, man, you would start having bread, dollar bills in your wallet. Come on, guys, that, that's Gnosticism. Do you know what brings the blessing? Obedience. Doesn't mean we're not going to walk through hard times. And it doesn't mean that we fund. Why do we give to ministries? To help promote the truth that they're sharing. I've got a teaching on the internet called The Spiritual Dynamic of the Tithe. And it goes back to the principle of first mentioned with Melchizedek and Abraham. And when Abraham tithed to him, Melchizedek opened up and gave him the revelation of the bread and the wine. And we find in the book of Hebrews that when he was ready to put that knife into the heart of Isaac, he saw that boy resurrected from the dead from the ashes of that burnt offering. Now, how did he get that when there had never been a resurrection in recorded human history? Melchizedek taught him the secret of the bread and the wine. But we have, we have turned tithing, we have turned giving, we have turned all this stuff into so many other things. Why do I give not only to fund what God is doing, but for God to fix this up here? Why? Because the windows of heaven are going to open up and I'm going to receive the revelation that I need of the thing that's holding me back. The Bible says that God, I mean, no, Israel didn't have a storehouse when Malachi wrote that. It didn't exist. What does the Bible say? The Bible says when we tithe, Jesus received the tithes. It goes, the high priest takes it. 
I think a lot of these things we need to rethink and rethink our motivations. I don't give to get. I give because I got. That's what the Apostle Paul taught. Don't don't give out of necessity like, oh, this is going to fix everything. He says give because God's blessed you and God has put on your heart to give. But we've turned it into a major machinery of, of the modern church, taking everything out of context. When I do the word and I am, my soul comes in line with my spirit and my flesh is doing the word, this is what the Apostle John says, so whatever we ask, we receive of him because we keep his commandments and do those things that are pleasing in his sight. Our biggest hindrance to prayer is not the devil, it's us. It's us. Yeah, look at, you know, we've been, I mean, God's opening up some new doors and we're getting ready to do some things. And some of this, uh, I've given up on 30 odd, odd years ago, you know, and, and I, I have a prophetic word that we're just now starting to fulfill that was spoken over me when Mary and I first got married right after we first got married. And so... In the ancient plains of Shinar, an evil was born. The first world king, the prototype transhuman, the ultimate despot, Nimrod. In Babylon, the son of perdition devised the Shinar Directive, a plan to enslave humanity and make war against the God of Heaven. God's intervention at the Tower of Babel only delayed Nimrod's hellish plans. As the powers of Mystery Babylon gather to create the new Tower of Babel and to prepare for the Son of Perdition's return, Heaven is issuing a clarion call to the remnant. The Shinar Directive will reveal the strategies of the enemy that will help you untangle yourself from them and become the victorious church. It is time for the remnant to wake up, discern the times, and be infused with Heaven's power to withstand the Shinar Directive by Dr. Michael Lake. Get your copy today at kingdomintelligencebriefing.com. That's kingdomintelligencebriefing.com. Thank you for watching Biblical Life TV. We hope and pray that today's program edified you in the Word of God. Stay informed. Tune in to weekly podcasts by Dr. Michael and Mary Lou Lake to keep you informed, inspired, and empowered in the Kingdom of God. Tune in to www.kingdomintelligencebriefing.com. That's kingdomintelligencebriefing.com. This video was made possible by our partners worldwide. Please prayerfully consider supporting the ministry that is preparing the remnant for the unfolding of end times prophecy. Send your offerings to Biblical Life, P.O. Box 160, Seymour, Missouri. That's Biblical Life, P.O. Box 160, Seymour, Missouri, 65746-0160. You can also donate online at store.biblical-life.com. That's store.biblical-life.com.